start in this equation, right? Yeah. <laughs> Morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's so confusing. All right. How many meals of yesterday is half lab? Right. Um, it's time to start talking about what happens when you put lenses together. This is going to be fun today. This is what I enjoy. And uh, I know you're staring at this going, there's no way I could possibly enjoy this yesterday. Well, just you wait. Okay? Just you wait. Because today, we're going to talk about cameras, we're going to talk about your eyeballs, we're going to talk about glasses and contact lenses, and then uh, depending on how distracted I get, we might get a telescope spike. Um, an optical system, okay, by definition, consists of one or more lenses, but typically is at least two, if not more. And so how do you handle when you've got multiple lenses in a system? Well, you treat them one at a time, okay? So here in this example, we've got two lenses, right? There is a lens that's closest to the object, which is usually called the objective lens, because it's the lens that's near the object. And then there is a eyepiece, okay? That would be the lens that's closest to where the person is doing the looking. Um, but what you do is you do it one at a time. You do the first, you start with the object, you draw the ray tracing diagram, do the math, whatever, for the first lens. Find where that image forms, and then the image of the first lens becomes the object for the second lens, and then you repeat, and you just keep doing that for however many elements or individual lenses or mirrors you might have in your system. So you could just kind of keep adding things in, the image of one lens becomes the object for the next lens, and so on and so forth. Now, we're not going to get into this too heavy in terms of all that mathematics. I don't think I gave you any homework problems. Did I, I didn't give you any homework problems with multiple things. I, I gave you telescope and microscope because we're going to talk about those in specifics, right? But lens systems can get pretty complicated really quickly, right? So here is a lens for a, um, I don't want to offend anybody, okay? But this would be the lens for a real camera, right? I'm not talking about this, right? Although these are getting good, right? This is where it's at, right? So inside of this thing is probably 15 or 20 different elements, right? Different individual lenses to pull off various things. But um, there's also other stuff going on in here. I don't know if you can see it, but I can open and close this thing called the aperture, okay? So on this particular lens, there's this uh, kind of white button right here. If you push it down and squeeze, you can change that aperture, okay? I'm gonna send this around so you can see, so you can play around with the aperture and uh, move the, the zoomer back and forth, right, okay, to see kind of what's in there. And you can kind of look in there, you can sort of see, okay, some of the lenses that are in there, right? So I'll send that one around. Um, we've got some others in here, okay? This one, you can just turn the, the ring to see the aperture. Uh, it's got fewer elements in it, but we'll, we'll start this on one side, so the other one on the other side. Just, just pass it around, get an idea, okay? You can feel the weight of it, right? And the weight is mostly the glass that's in there, the optics. It's not necessarily anything. Try not to like push your fingers on the glass on the ends. If you do, it's no big deal there. They're broken. They're, they're not working very good anymore, okay? But um, we want to talk about sort of these systems in the context of what kinds of images are forming, real, virtual, blah, 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 right? All that language that we learned in dealing with singular lenses just applied to these more complicated systems. So we'll start with cameras, we'll move to the eyeball, and then we'll talk about corrective, correcting vision, right, for people that can't see far away or can't see up close. And then we'll get to microscopes and telescopes. So here is a, kind of a, a breakdown of, of how a camera works. And, and this does apply, believe it or not, to your cell phone. It's just cell phones have gotten a little bit more clever about what they consider to be an aperture or a shutter, okay, and all that sort of thing. In a real camera, uh, the shutter might actually be a physical shutter. Okay, something that opens and closes to let light in. Nowadays, in more modern um, digital cameras, uh, you know, big full-frame cameras, those shutters can be digital shutters where the sensor just basically turns on and off, on and off, right? But nonetheless, 
There's a series of lenses that is supposed to be doing something. You want to take an object that you want to capture a picture of, right? And get an image to form on the sensor that is in focus. So the sensor has to be at the focal plane of the optical system that's sitting in front of it. While simultaneously being able to correct for either too much light or not enough light that's coming into the system. So there's several engineering problems here. Number one, forming the image, which we've done the basic physics of, right? Getting, getting the image to focus at the correct place inside of the camera, which is why if you've ever seen a picture that's out of focus, right? It just means that the light, right? Those rays were not coming to a point, right? We, the, 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 the focal plane was, of course, you don't move the sensor back and forth, okay? You're moving the image distance back and forth in the lens system. Now, most people are familiar with a cam operating a camera, which is, right? Okay? Unfortunately. <laughs> right? The, the explosion in the number of photographs, right, that are available to humanity cannot be understated with the advent of everybody having a camera in their pocket. Um, but the quality of pictures and photographs has really gone down. <laughs> because let's face it, pictures of people eating in a restaurant, whatever food they're eating is not good. It's like the photo equivalent of having somebody tell you about your dreams. It's like, anyway. We got to handle not only focusing the image, we got to handle how much light is hitting that sensor. Because if it's film, too much light can overexpose the film and lead to no picture. Uh, too little light, <coughs> underexposing, and it looks dark. Same thing happens for a digital sensor. The digital sensor can be overwhelmed by light and just kind of bleed and have white pixels everywhere. Or you can't, there can be not enough there, in which case the sensor is sort of using noise in order to generate a picture which isn't good either. So, so how do we handle this kind of stuff? Well, in a camera, in all cameras, there is either a physical or virtual aperture. And this aperture is responsible for letting either lots of light in to the system or very little. But this aperture does have optical effects when you go about taking the picture. And I want to want to talk about some of those optical effects, um, not necessarily mathematically, okay? But I do, there's a, there's a tiny bit of math here, okay? Because some of these, some of the ways that um, we talk about cameras can be a little bit funky. First of all, every lens has either a variable or fixed F number associated with it sometimes called an f-stop, okay? The stop, because on physical apertures, they, there's actually like these set positions that it can be at. In other words, it can be at an f number of 2.8 or 4, but it really can't be in between, okay? Uh, modern digital apertures, they can actually have an infinite number of f-stops, but generally don't. They generally will confer they'll match up with the quote-unquote old-fashioned physical apertures that are out there. But what is, what is an F number? The, the F number itself, okay, <clears throat> is defined as the focal length of the lens divided by the diameter of the aperture. So the focal length is set by the glass. It's set by the lens in the camera, or lenses. So it's, it's a effective focal length of the lens. <clears throat> and then the diameter is set by that iris, the physical iris that's inside of the lens. What happens if you increase the diameter? So well, let's assume the focal length stays the same. What happens if you make the diameter, the, the diameter big? The F number gets smaller. So the smaller the F number that you're being told, the larger the aperture of that lens is. Now, Cell phone companies, for some reason, like to list the effective F number of the camera on the phone and the like bragging rights for how low the F number can go. What are they, what are they trying to communicate with a low F number? What's that? With a really large diameter opening, you can let 
more light in. So that basically is communicating that the sensor and the lens setup can collect light in a low light environment like this one. Okay? Whereas if you've got a high F number, then what happens to the diameter of your opening? It gets really small. So it feels a little bit backwards, right? But if you do photography enough, you get used to this idea that with a low F number, you can be taking pictures in areas that have very little light. And you've got to increase your F number as the light gets brighter in order to have correct exposure for photo. Again, most of us, we just hit the button on our phone, and it automatically figures all this stuff out for us. We do live in an incredible age. But <laughs> growing up, I, I shot pictures for the yearbook and for the school newspaper. My camera was not automatical. I had to set film. I had to know the film speed. I had to guess, like, aperture. Like, my camera would give me some readings in there about whether my exposure was going to be good, but you had to get practice to be able to get the right combinations of things. But there's another thing that happens with this opening, the size of the opening in a lens, and it has something to do with depth of field. And my goal in the next five minutes is to make you a better photographer. Okay? This is something, it's been one of my hobbies for a long time. I don't do it very much anymore. But photography is very much a part of who I was growing up and sort of moving into my adult years. And I can't stand pictures like this. Okay? And it's not because of the subject. It's because of how the shot has been taken. Okay? Often people, you're very judgmental when it comes to pictures. I'm not judging like the subject of the picture, right? Whether it's a good landscape picture, a good people picture, or whatever, right? Like, like I take issue with how the picture has been taken because there's some, there's several things going on here, but one of them is called depth of field. The depth of field of a picture, the depth of field of a camera, the depth of field of any optical system is a way of talking about how many things can be in focus in the picture simultaneously. Now, we tend not to think about this when it comes to our eyeballs because we feel like everything is always in focus, right? Why do we think everything is always in focus? Our eyes are constantly shifting around, right? I might be looking at Scott right now, but if I go back and look at Jeff, right, I, my brain will stitch those two pictures together assuming they're always in focus. But try this right now, okay? Those of you looking, okay, at, from the back, and if you're in the front, maybe turn around and look towards the back. I want you to look at somebody far away. Don't move your eyes and see how focused the people are who are close to you. They're actually out of focus, aren't they? So then when, if you shift to somebody that's right next to you, don't, don't move your eyes, but try to take into account the people that are far away. Are they in focus? No. Your eye, like a camera, can't focus on everything all the time. What it does is it jumps around and your brain stitches together <laughs> this virtual reality, right? Okay, where everything's in focus, and it is. The diameter, the opening of the aperture on a camera can actually affect how well you can image something. So when it comes to this, a low F number, okay? What does a low F number mean? Really wide opening. A low F number has a very small depth of field, meaning that the focus can't be very far. Things that are in focus, right, are not very far apart from each other. Whereas if you have a high F number, meaning the aperture is what? Smaller, you get more depth of field, meaning that things in the foreground, take a look at the bricks, right? Do you see how the bricks are in focus? As well as the bush, as well as the car, as well as the houses way, way back there. This picture has a really large depth of field, meaning that things up closer in focus 
and things far away are in focus. This picture, on the other hand, has a very narrow depth of field. There is one thing that is in focus in this picture. So aside not comparing the fact that this is a picture of a street and this is a picture of a dead flower, right? Like getting beyond like what the subject is, which of these two pictures is more interesting? It's the second one. Why? There is one thing that your brain can focus on in this picture. Your, your visual system is immediately drawn to the thing that's in focus. And then there's this background. We can't tell what the background is. Maybe more dead flowers, right? Maybe Mars. I don't know, right? But there's, there's mystery, right? Okay. Whereas in this picture, what are you focusing on? That is not centered. Okay. <laughs> Different story. Okay. Your brain, there's no visual cue here as to what is the subject of this picture, right? And what it's doing. So depth of field is a trick. It's a psychological manipulation. It, it comes from very real physics. But it is a psychological effect in our brain that helps us to latch on to things. Now, these next couple of pictures are going to be really bad pictures, but they really show what's going on here. Okay? So don't ever set up a bunch of matches in clay with a quarter. It's just a dumb picture, right? <laughs> but do you see how the quarter is in focus and maybe a few of the matches next to the quarter, but all the other matches are out of focus? It naturally draws the eye and causes your brain to focus on the thing that is in focus. As you look at the picture, you come from the edges and immediately look towards the middle and know what you're supposed to be looking at. Whereas, in this picture, same picture, same setup, right? with a larger depth of field. You see how all the matches are in focus? Also notice, it's darker. Why did it get darker? Less light. It's a larger depth of field, which means the aperture got taken down, which means less light was available, and so they were struggling with getting the exposure. Here, the exposure is actually a little bit overblown, right? There's just a little bit, it's a little bit too bright, okay? Again, to get a narrow depth of field, what does your aperture have to be? Really large. So depth of field is affected by aperture. It's true for your eye as well as anything else. But I think we need to have a little bit of a discussion. Let's, let's go on the I, I wish I, I had a problem. I wanted to provide lots of examples of what I'm about to teach you. And I went and I looked and I looked and I looked and there was copyright issues and there were too many pictures. And I realized after I had 100 slides in my presentation, I probably shouldn't go this right? So, but let's just talk about something else. This is a little bit tangential, but again, my goal is to make you better photographers. And I've already taught you one trick, which is depth of field. In your cell phone, you don't have a depth of field control. I mean, you can get some apps that if your camera supports it, you can pull off some tricks. But what your camera, what your phone has instead, probably, is something called portrait mode, okay? And then if you've ever turned into portrait mode, I wish I, I, I tried to get, figure out how to get this to work. If you ever go to portrait mode, you'll notice something that portrait mode will do. It'll do that. It'll focus, okay, on the thing that, like, you're telling the camera to look at, and it will digitally blur the background and the foreground. So this is a digital depth of field trick to make the picture more interesting. So if you are taking somebody, I, I've had people, oh, you take such good picture, you take my picture, right? Okay. The, 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 some of the shots that you see of our, of our teachers out there, right? We're just me taking pictures, right? So what did I do? I put my phone out, put it into portrait mode. It's like instant, you're a good photographer. <laughs> 
On a real camera, you'd have to play around with your aperture and get that narrow depth of field, right? To get the background blurred out, right? All that kind of stuff. But you, there are digital tools, and portrait mode is a way of changing the depth of field. It's also a effect known as uh, bokeh, I think is what they call it. Um, spelled weird French way. Um, but it's a depth of field trick, okay? And it's taking advantage of the human visual processing system to focus on things that are in focus and ignore things that are out of focus. So if you take a picture of somebody standing next to a bush, right, and you have a large depth of field and everything's in focus, you see a person, you see a bush, your brain's kind of going bush, person, bush, person. But if you do portrait mode, it'll blur the bush and the person will be in focus and now it's a nice picture. All right, here's another thing that you're going to do because I think almost all cell phones do this nowadays. Okay? You're going to go into your settings, okay, and you're going to turn on something and I, again, wish I could show this to you, but I'll just have some people report it. Does anybody notice what's different about the display of my phone camera? Do you, you see the, what's on the picture? There's a grid. Okay, do you see the grid? Okay. Some of you are probably annoyingly turned that off. Like, why would I want a grid? Okay. So, can I be old for a second? Stop taking pictures and videos like this. Okay? Seriously. Until we start mounting all of our TVs in our homes like this, do it this way. Okay? Actually, it doesn't matter. You can take it both ways. I should be nice. Okay? <laughs> this grid, okay, is there to help you take better pictures. And it's, it's reinforcing something called the rule of thirds. Okay. In the rule of thirds, you divide vertically and horizontally your view into three sections. And if you want to make your picture like instantly more interesting, whatever the thing you're taking a picture of, put it at one of the intersecting points. It's like magic. So if you're taking the picture of somebody's face and you take, you put their face like directly in the middle, okay, that picture will be less interesting than if you maybe put their face right there or maybe their eye at one of these intersection points. Just try it. Turn the grid on and then start taking pictures of things where the, the thing you want to take a picture of is at one of those intersecting points all of a sudden, your pictures will be 100% better. And people go, oh, you take some good pictures. OK? Let me see if I can't show you. I, I tried to pull up some of these examples, but they were, there was too many of them all over the place. I know, you can't see anything yet. OK? So let me. I was looking for pictures that showed like a before and an after, like a bad rule of thirds and a good rule of thirds of exactly the same picture. But look at that cheetah right there, okay, over there. Do you see how they stuck the cheetah's head at one of the intersecting points in the picture? That automatically makes the picture more interesting. Just by shifting, right? the composition of the photo, right? The photo of the little girl, the photo of the couple, right? Yes, you could center them in that picture, but if you saw the centered picture and then you saw the one that were there, you would pick the one that's at the rule of thirds. It's like, it's like built into our visual system to have a preference for the rule of thirds. There's, other, there's another thing called the golden ratio. Um, yeah, so, so some, like, I think I've got an app on, not the default app, but I've got another app that will show me the golden ratio. And if you line up a picture according to the golden ratio, it just automatically makes the picture, like, more interesting, right? Um, I'm not seeing any of the ones. See how they stuck the horse in this one, right? Rather than the horse being right in the center of the picture, the horse is at the rule of thirds, and it just like naturally makes the picture better. It's like this weird psychological trick that is so easy to pull off. 
What are they doing in this picture right here? The dogs at the rule of thirds and the depth of field has been manipulated. And it's like, that's not a very good looking dog, but that's an interesting picture. <laughs> right? Well, it's not. It's poop brown color. Right? I've seen better dogs. He's cute. Right? Okay. He's paying attention to whoever's taking the picture. The little cute tilt of the head that they do to manipulate us into giving them food. <laughs> right? But the picture, the, like the way it's been taken, is so much better than if they just centered the dog and the whole forest was in focus. Think about these things when you're taking pictures, right? Of course, if something's going down and you need to record it, don't worry about any of this, right? Okay? But if you're sitting there going, oh, that's a really neat picture of my dog, my partner, whatever, at sunset, throw the grid on. Put the dog at one of those intersecting points. It'll be like magic. And people will go, and you put it on Instagram, and people will go, oh, that's amazing. No Instagram filters required. But seriously, look up the rule of thirds. If there's one thing I could teach you in photography, like I teach that to some people, and it just blows their mind. They're like, my pictures are so much better. Like, yeah. Because we're tricking, we're using the brain's visual system, right? It's preference for things and taking advantage of it. And you'll see this in movies, okay? Heroes often are not at the center of the frame. They're usually at one of the points of the rules of thirds, right, when they're talking. Anyway. Um, oh my gosh. What just happened? Biology just happened, right? Because these are the kind of pictures I would get when I was in anatomy and physiology for all of like one week. <laughs> Before they told me I had to like actually memorize things. I was like, <laughs> no. I want to learn about it. I don't want to have to memorize it. Um, this is just an amazing structure, right? I mean, just the, how the eyes put together, how it works, when it goes wrong, right? Just all of these different things. But I want to go at this from the, I don't know, the, of course, the physics -y point of view, and we'll start doing some things. But we got to stand back, I think, and just sort of admire how amazing this is, right? Um, that electromagnetic waves can be captured by cells, right? And that those cells can turn those photons into electrical energy and transmit it to the brain, and your brain goes, oh, this is what it is, right? So let's talk a little bit about how that works. The, the main refractive power of your eye. So the thing that does the most bending of light and focusing of light is not the lens. Everybody thinks it's the lens, but it's not. Most of the bending of light happens in the cornea. And that's because the index of refraction difference between the air and your cornea is the largest difference. The index of refraction between the cornea and your lens and the vitreous humor, I don't know why it's funny, inside of your eye, okay? It, that was a low hanging <laughs> It doesn't change that much. So the cornea is what's doing most of the focusing in your eye, but it has a kind of a set focus. It generally doesn't change its shape. That's a lie. But like it doesn't change its shape on the fly from day to day. It changes its shape over time. Okay? So the lens then, what is it doing? Like what is it for? It's not really for focusing. The cornea does the focusing. The lens is the last little tiny adjustment. And we're actually going to calculate here in just a minute. We're going to calculate just how little okay, the eye can focus and have things go in and out of focus. Your lens in your eye accommodates for all the different focal planes that our eyes are trying to see. What do I mean by that? Remember that little example I did where you looked at people up close and saw people far away out of focus and blah, 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 blah? 
I want you right now to take your hand out, okay, and hold it in front of your face. And, and get to a point, like turn around so you can see far across the room. I need you to be able to see like a far wall and your hand. I just want you to shift your focus from your fingers to the far wall and back again. And as you do that, just go back and forth every second. I want you to concentrate on how it feels in your eye. Okay, now take your hand, looking at your fingers, and pull your hand and get it as close to your face, keeping it in focus. As close to your face as you can, keeping it in focus. And concentrate on what it feels like in your eyes. Okay, stop, you're gonna get a headache. Okay. <laughs> what did it feel like switching back and forth between far and close up? Did you feel the muscles in your eyes? And then as you brought it in, were your muscles relaxing or getting more and more tense? Getting more tense. The muscles, that can, the, the cilia, ciliary muscles, apparently is what they're called, right? Those muscles around the eye, okay, that hold the lens in place, cause the lens to change its shape and accommodate for the different focal lengths, okay, that are trying to be achieved as you look at something far away and something up close. When you look at something far away, the muscles in your eye are completely relaxed. In fact, they're fully relaxed when you're looking at something infinitely far away. So how far away is infinity? <laughs> about 15 feet, okay, or about 5 meters, okay? Anything past about 15 feet in front of your nose, your eye is fully relaxed. There's really no difference in focusing between something that's miles away, okay, and something that is 15 feet away. Starting at around 15 feet, your eye has to start tightening its muscles, but it does most of its tightening, okay, up close. Where do we spend most of our time nowadays? Indoors. In terms of how far away things are from our faces? <laughs> right? Talk to me about the tension in your eyes if you stare at a screen for hours on end that's two feet away from your face. What happens if I ask you to hold a 10 pound weight out at the end of your extended arm for any length of time? So you are. <laughs> right? With the rest of us in here, maybe. Right? It's, it gets tired, and when your muscles get tired, what happens? They get sore. And so students will be sitting there in grass or somewhere, right? And walk over, and I can tell, I know what's going on. They're doing physics, number one, that not, right? So there's emotional, mental trauma going on. But they've been staring at that screen for two hours. And I walk over, how you doing? It's like, do you have a headache? Like, yeah, my eyes hurt. Why? Right? So how do you fight this? Go outside. Oh. Go outside. <laughs> Go outside. <laughs> Go <laughs> <laughs> All you need to do every 10 to 15 minutes is for 20 seconds. 30 se It doesn't take long for the muscles in your eyes to relax, okay? 20 or 30 seconds, just look up and look away. Look out of a window. Look across the room. Close your eyes. Well, closing your eyes, that may be dangerous, you might go to sleep. <laughs> closing your eyes fully relaxes. And all you need is 20 seconds. And then you can be right back in it for another 15 minutes. Right? Some of you are like, Mr. Bell, I'm attention deficit. I look away all the time. <laughs> if you can start building into that routine, you will notice that you can, do, you can study for a long time. You're taking a break every 10 minutes for your eyes to just look somewhere else. So it's the ciliary muscles? Mm -hmm. That's probably why it's hubris. 
Uh, <laughs> I already did that joke. Yeah, I know. Believe me, I, 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 know, I know all puns. I'm a dad. All right, so the lens is responsible for adjusting the focal length of the eye because the cornea can't adjust. It's the lens that does the adjusting, but the cornea does most of the focusing. And that focus needs to, the focal plane of your eye has to be on the back side of your eye where you have your retina, retina and more particularly your fovea. Okay, fovea is like the concentrated part of your retina. So the retina is the part of your eye that's got all the cells in it that are collecting light. But the fovea is like the, same, like the central high resolution, high definition part of your vision. If you kind of look out and just like kind of dot let your eyes wander about okay you'll notice that right in the center of your field of view is very sharp but then it gets blurry in a hurry okay as you, as you again don't look over there but just try to take into account right how blurry things really are okay out at the edges of your vision and even, it's, it's really kind of a narrow spot that's really in focus, and then it really blurs out pretty quick. That's because the fovea has a lot of DPI, okay, dots per inch, right, cells per inch, and then it sort of gets less and less as you go. So is the iris like an aperture? The iris is your aperture, okay, and it's, so your pupil opens and closes, right, uh, to let more or less light in. So when it's dark, like it is in here, I dim the lights on purpose, right, what do your eyes do? They dilate, okay? So what happens to your depth of field? Big diameter opening, shorter depth of field. You probably didn't notice it because your eyes are bouncing around and your brain is stitching together this perfect visual field that's always in focus. But when you, when you think about it, when you concentrate on it, you realize when it's dark, like you have a hard time seeing things. Well, okay, A, it's dark. But B, your eyes have dilated to the point where it's getting harder to focus on all things in the visual field. So you'll trip over the dog or the Lego or whatever it was, right? You didn't see it because it's dark, but also because it, you, could, you were focusing on something else, literally. Your focal plane was narrower. You didn't see the other thing. So, so is that why like, predators, they'll have their pupils really, really small? Yeah. They want to keep things in focus. Okay. So are, are doctors, they check for your pupil or is it something else? Okay, so let's clear something up. There's two kinds of eye doctors, okay? The real ones and the fake ones. <laughs> there are optometrists. What do optometrists do? They do glasses. They correct vision problems, okay? Externally. They're not surgeons, okay? They are experts in correcting visual problems. People can't focus. That's what an optometrist does. What's the doctor that actually looks at the health of your eye? An ophthalmologist. That's right. I get the Okay. Ophthalmologists are, can be surgeons, but more generally are responsible for the health of your eye. How is your lens? How is your cornea? How is your iris? How is it? So when you go for an eye exam, if you go to a decent place, i.e. not Costco or Walmart, you will see two doctors usually. A doctor will come in who does the vision correction, right? You need glasses, that kind of stuff. And then another doctor will come in and do some nasty things to your eyes, like shine bright lights into them and put eye drops and all kinds of, right? Because what they're doing is looking at eye health. They're looking at your cornea. They're looking at your um, fovea. They're looking at the all retina and all these different kinds of things, right? Just to make sure that your eyes are healthy. So, so get eye exams. You get an eye exam every year. Your vision, more than anything, like dentist, eyes, <laughs> right? Like seriously, eyes, right? You can lose teeth and get teeth replaced. Eyes, kind of harder. So get the eye exam. Make sure you're doing it with an ophthalmologist. That's number one. Optometrist if you need the correction, but ophthalmologist, definitely. Optometrist or eye technician. Right. They're doctors. I don't want to discount their degree or their learning or anything. I'm just saying one of them's about the health of your eye and the other one is about making you see better. Right? 
Uh, now, is there a crossover between the disciplines? Of course. Can an optometrist like see a cataract or a problem in the eye? Yes, but then they'll hand off to an ophthalmologist. But they generally won't unless both of them are working together. Anyway, <clears throat> here is uh, color-coded. This is not actually how it looks. Difference between rods and cones. So the rod and cone cells are what are on your retina that are responsible for gathering light. These are the actual structures that collect photons in your eye. Now, rod cells are all about contrast. They're really about sort of bright and dark, okay? Um, Grayscale, if you will, okay? Really good at a lot of different variations in light intensity. The cone cells aren't so good at that. What the cone cells are good at is picking up frequency or color of light. So the cone cells are responsible for seeing the colors. The rod cells are responsible for seeing like intensity or black and white or grayscale. And you have a lot more rod cells than cone cells. Cone cells tend to be packed really tightly in the fovea, but rod cells are packed kind of tightly there, but also kind of all over the retina. I can't remember what it is. There's, it's like a factor of 30 more rod cells than cone cells in your retina. Um, that, don't quote me on that one. We've got to go find a biologist. Um, but it, it's a big number, okay? Which is why at night, we can still see, see someone in the dark, but we tend not to see color. When you're asking people to recall things that they saw at night, they often will not tell you the color of things because they don't know what the color is because the cone cells can't pick it up, okay? The, the light isn't bright enough. Um, whereas you can make out the shadowy shapes that are tracking you in the forest and growling behind you. Um, at any rate, the cells are all attached to something called the optic nerve, which is a bundle of nerves that go, there's a nerve ending on every single one of these cells that then goes to your brain, and your brain in its optic center, I think it's back here, um, is what puts together, right, all of that information to make the visual field that we see. It is an incredible incredible structure. And then pictures like this usually freak people out. Okay. Too close, too close. But I wanted to show it to you because you can see the edge of the cornea out there, right? That, here's the rest of the universe, and here's the innerverse, right? Okay, so there's the boundary between you and the rest of the universe. It's right there, okay? at the cornea where most of the correction takes place. Okay, so let's get into uh, how we correct things, okay? When, when vision goes wrong, in a sense. And again, I, I don't want to be offensive, but I am going to use the term normal to describe an eye that doesn't need glasses or contact lenses, okay? You're beautiful, okay? Your glasses, your contacts, everything's wonderful. There's nothing wrong with you, okay? Your eyes do need some help, though, if you wear any kind of corrective optic, okay? And I wore, I wore glasses from the time I was 14 to the time I was 42, okay? At 42, I got laser eyes, right? We can talk all about LASIK here in a bit. But a normal eye can focus properly. The light can come in, and not needing any help, the cornea and the lens working together can form images on the retina. Now, I want you to notice something. This is from a physics textbook, but you'll see these in anatomy, physiology, and biology textbooks all the time. These pictures are wrong. They're like flat out lies. Because if your eye focused all the light down to a point on your retina, what would you see? A dot. You would just see a bright light, okay? You wouldn't see any of it. The light rays actually have to, like, these rays are not the principal rays that are depicted in all the diagrams up into this point. Okay? These are what we call marginal rays. But the point is, is they're not really showing you the real thing that's happening. Okay? The image is being focused on your retina, right? Okay? But there's no image here. They're just showing parallel lines coming. Anyway, just, just, just to point out that there's things wrong. But the communication of the picture is important because what are they trying to communicate in this middle picture? The focus is too hard, right? The focusing is happening too much. 
and the image is forming in a point in front of the retina, which is that, because then it's fuzzy. So this eye is called myopic. Okay? A myopic eye focuses too hard. Normal people would say nearsighted. So when you see somebody that needs to wear glasses to see things far away, we call that person a nearsighted person. I am not responsible for any of these terms. Okay? Why do we call them a nearsighted person? Because I can read this, but not that. Brian, you can take your glasses off and see things up close, right? Yeah. But everything far away goes away. You're all blurry. Yeah. Okay? Right? So, Brian, may I use you as an example, is a nearsighted person, meaning unaided, he can see things up close. So all of you that are wearing glasses or contact lenses, I'm guessing, have myopic eyes. You need assistance in seeing things far away. Okay? Well, what's going on down here in the hyperopic or far-sighted eye? You could tell me about the focusing power of this eye. It's weak, right? It's not focusing enough because the image is forming behind the retina, right? Or the focal plane is behind the retina. And no accommodation, natural accommodation of the eye can bring this image into focus. This person is far-sighted, meaning what? What can they see? Far away. It's in the name, right? Far-sighted people can see far away, but can't see up close. Near-sighted people can see what? Near or close to them, but they can't see far away. You got it? You think you do. I'm about to totally mess it up, okay? Because you're going to start doing some math, you're going to get confused, and you're going to be like, oh, this is hard. It's, it's not hard, it's just weird, okay? So hang on for the ride. What we do, okay, to correct the vision is we put a lens, an additional lens. So in the case of a far-sighted person, whose eye can't focus enough, what kind of lens do they need to use in order to see anything up close? Think, their eye doesn't focus enough. So what kind of lens causes light to become more focused? A converging or diverging lens? A converging lens. It brings light together, right? So, far-sighted people need lenses that are converging lenses because they need help focusing the light down. So, here we've got a thumbtack, right? And in a far-sighted eye or hyperopic eye, okay, the image is forming too far away. It's on the back, like beyond their retina, so it's not in focus, right? By putting the converging lens in the system, we're still using their natural ability to focus, which is a little bit weak, but the converging lens causes the light to focus before it ever gets to their cornea, so that by the time it gets to the cornea, boom, they can now focus properly. Here's what it looks like. Simulate, okay? A far-sighted person has trouble focusing on near things. They can see far away things just fine. But near things are a struggle. And you probably know somebody in your life that is farsighted. We need to be nice. Not, not pick on any people, but we do need to admit, okay, as a function of the biology of the human race, as you become more wisdom. wiser, thank you, okay, and have lived more years on this planet, the lens loses its ability to accommodate. It becomes stiffer. And the ability for somebody to focus, the, the near point, which is the defined as the closest point that a person can see in front of their face without the help of glasses, okay? The near point, the closest point of focus for objects of the human eye, 
starts to migrate outwards. The eye is becoming stiffer, the lens is becoming stiffer, and you start getting to the point where if you want to be able to read something, right, it's got to be really far away from your face. Your parents, your grandparents, people you know who are older and have more gray hairs than you, right, probably have this thing where they pull out their phone and they're like, right, okay? What are they trying to do? They're trying to focus on it, right? And they've learned they've got to move it way out there to focus on it, right? And as soon as you put something out that far away, what happens to the two-point font that's on the screen? It's too small. The kid's too small, right? And so that person has to go, oh, where did I, where did I put my reading glasses? Right? Okay. And they have to wear glasses to read things up close. But this gives rise to, here's my old glasses. If these were my read, oh my gosh, I was blind. <laughs> if these were, right, the glasses, this is really weird. Um, if these were the glasses that I would use to do reading glasses, right, okay, this gives rise to the <laughs> disapproving stare, right? Why do people that need reading glasses wear their glasses like this sometimes? Or have those funny half glasses? You don't want to have to sit there and be reading something and go, oh, let's see if I want to take my glasses off, right? You can just put them right here, and you can look down through the glasses while you're reading, and then you just shift your eyes up to look far away, right? Okay? And then you can do the disapproving stare. Um, so I threw a few things at you there. What's the near point? The closest that a human being can see something without help. I mean, without glasses or that kind of stuff. The normal near point, the defined near point for unaided vision is 25 centimeters. It's a kind of a convention. It's a decided on number. When you go in for your eye exam, they'll give you a little card of things to read, okay? And they'll, they'll tell you, okay, which line can you read? And what they're not, they don't really care which size of font you can read. They're looking at how far away from your face you're holding it, okay? And they can get a really quick gauge as to where your near point is. Because if you're like, right, okay, or if you're like Brian, and I pick on Brian just because I know, okay? When I used to wear glasses, I could take my glasses off and I could see something this close to my face and still focus on it. Now, I couldn't see any farther than that, right, with my glasses off. But man, if I needed to solder something on a circuit board, wow! <laughs> it was no problem. So, a person who is nearsighted has problem with their, sorry, a person who is farsighted has a problem with their near point. They can't focus at 25 centimeters. Their near point could be a meter in front of the two meters in front of their face, right? Everything two meters and closer is out of or can't be focused on, right? But everything past that is just fine. So a nearsighted person has the opposite problem. A nearsighted person who has no trouble looking up close at things has a depressed far point. So what's the normal far point? Yes, 15 feet, which is also called infinity. Okay. So a normal eye should have a far point of infinity, meaning things that are infinitely far away should be in focus, and a near point of 25 centimeters. Any deviation from those is considered a problem when it comes to, oh, and we should say here, kids. You give a kid a crayon, right, and a piece of paper, or maybe a coloring book or something. What do they do? They start drawing? Okay, what are they actually doing? Have you ever really watched? They'll take their sheet, right, and they'll take their crayon, right, and they'll sit at their desk, and the desk is all, wait, 
right? Okay. And what do they do? <laughs> Watch next time a kid color in a coloring book, okay? They will put that page. Their nose is like grazing the surface. They look up and there's crayon on their nose, right? What are they, what's going on? Why are they doing that? Some stupid adult probably told them to color in the lines. And now they're all anxious. Their near points are measured in like four centimeters. Five centimeters. Like the near point of a kid's eye is nice and flexible. It's got a lot of accommodation, right? It's right up next against their face. They can see far away. They can see up close. They can see everywhere, right? And so they will. They'll get right in close to something because they can see it. As we get older and our eyes start firming up and the accommodation becomes less, that near point begins to move out, okay? We have less and less accommodation as we grow older. All right, so that's, uh, oh, you know what? Before we do this one, I did promise something else. Let's calculate the change in focal length of the human eye based on these two numbers, right? So what does the focal length of the eye need to be? The lens, we'll just do the lens in your eye. Okay? And when I say the lens in the eye, I mean the system of cornea plus lens. We're going to consider that one thing so that we, we can do a simple calculation using the simple, I did that backwards, but you get the idea, right? The, the thin lens equation that we have, right? Okay. And by the way, it's the thin lens equation that most uh, optometrists use. Well, they don't use it. All of their devices are calibrated to it. Uh, because it's a it's a really good really good um, simplification, right? So we're going to calculate this focal length. What is the focal length of the eye um, when the object's at the near point? Okay. So the way we're going to kind of do this, okay, is. I have to tell you kind of what the image distance is, right, for the lens. And on average, a good number to use, you're not going to really need to know this that much, but, but in the eye, right, with the lens here in the front, and then right, there's about a two and a half centimeter distance optically that needs to be traveled, okay? So if we set our image distance to be 2.5 centimeters, What's the focal length of the lens when we put something at the, at the near point of the eye? So, at the near point of 25 centimeters, which means this is our object distance, we get 1 over 25 plus 1 over 2.5 equals 1 over the focal length. And that focal length ends up being 2.3 centimeters. So, so when you're focusing at the near, normal near point of 25 centimeters, 2.3 centimeter focal length of your eye system. Okay, what about when we're at the far point of infinity? So infinity is our object distance. 1 over f is going to be equal to 1 over our object distance, which is infinity, plus 1 over 2.5. What's 1 over infinity? Zero. Zero. And what's 1 over f equals 1 over 2.5 equal to? Yeah, nearsighted people are really easy to correct for. Okay. So the focal length of this lens is 2.5 centimeters. Notice that there is a 2 millimeter difference in focal length in your eye system between focusing on something at the near point and something focusing at the far. That means that if your eye changes its longitudinal axis distance the, from, the, from the front of your eye to the back of your eye by three millimeters, all of a sudden you have a problem seeing. If the lens in your eye loses the ability to accommodate a two millimeter focal length change and can only accommodate half of a millimeter of focal length, you're going to have vision problems. So it's no surprise that people have vision problems. 
it's super easy to get outside. Oh my gosh, a two millimeter, two millimeter difference. All right, so let's go back to, whoops, we're awake now, it's okay. Let's go to this, okay, and see if we can't figure out the focal length of the lens that needs to be prescribed, okay, to a person that's having trouble seeing up close. Dr. Orphy, you have trouble seeing up close? <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a nerd thing? Okay. Of course. He knows that. He just doesn't eat. All right. So we have, now notice, the doctor has figured out that the near point is 57 centimeters. What does that mean? Where can this person see? 57 centimeters and beyond. Right? That's it. So, we need to find the focal length. One of the things you need to understand about correcting vision is that we want the person to be able to hold what they're trying to read or see at a normal near point. And what's the normal near point? Centimeters. But where can the person actually focus? At 57. So the goal of every corrective optic, and this is going to cause no end of frustration for you, the goal of every corrective optic is to produce an image at the place where that person can see it. Where can this person see things? 57 centimeters. So what is the image distance in this problem? What is the object distance in this problem? Where are we placing the thing that we want them to be able to see? At 25. We want them to be able to hold it at the normal near point of 25 centimeters. That, oops, that means, so here is the optical system, okay? Here's the lens in the eye, so to speak, right? Okay, or think of it more as like, this is the set of glasses we're putting on, so the glasses and the eyeball and the cornea are all working together, right, to cause this to happen. If we put the object there, okay, and their eye is over here. That's supposed to be an eyeball. Scary eyeball. Okay. Where are we putting the image that this lens is making? Back of the eye? There is light that hits the back of the eye, but that's not the lens that's sitting in the front. They put their glasses on. Where is the person naturally able to focus on things? 57 centimeters where? The front or the back side of this optical system? Normal near point of 25, person can only see 57. Where does this image form? on the front side of the optical system. It's this image right here that will be projected on the back of their eye for them to see. We're producing an image at the place where they can focus on. They can't focus on 25. We put the object at 25. But we want the image to form at 57. And if the image is on the front side of the lens, what sign do we give it? A negative sign. Look at your sign conventions. When the image forms on the front side of a lens, what sign does it get? A negative sign. So you'd have to put in negative 57. How easy is it to get this wrong? So we do 1 over 25 
plus 1 over a negative 57 equals 1 over f to solve for the focal length. And the focal length is 44 centimeters. So that's the focal length of the lens that is required. Now, um, uh, optometrists are pretty smart people. And so rather than having to do a bunch of one overs all the time, they will often give you your prescription not in the focal length of the lens that you need, but in the optical power of the lens. Optical power is the inverse of the focal length. <laughs> so basically what they're doing is they're not doing the last one over, right? One over image distance, one over object distance, and then they just get a number. In this case, that number is 2.27 capital D for diopters, and a diopter is an inverse meter. So they do switch it into meters. They don't do it in centimeters, they do it in meters, okay? But optical power, so if you have a prescription for your lenses and it says plus two or minus five or something on there, okay? That's the optical power. Invert that number and you have the focal length of the lens, okay? So the corrections that you'll see, if you go down and someday you'll have to go buy reading glasses. And the reading glasses will say plus 1.5 or plus 2.5 to try to indicate the optical power, right? It's just the focal length of the line is changing. All right. So we got the optical power, okay? And we got the focal length. And it's positive. And what did the sign conventions tell us about the kind of lens that's required? A converging lens, right? Positive focal length. What kind of image is that? Magnified or reduced? Magnified. It's magnified. You saw this yesterday. You looked through a converging lens in class at a upright, magnified, virtual image. Run the simulation. Look at your pictures. When the object is inside the focal length of a converging lens, you always get a virtual image. So people that wear reading glasses, what are they looking at? Virtual reality. You don't need Apple or Meta or anybody else to come up with virtual reality goggles. We've got them. How can a virtual image create something real in my brain. Real light hits your eyes. But again, your brain will chase those rays back to their point of origin and invent something that looks bigger than it really is. Okay. So here's nearsighted. So nearsighted people, again, their eyes focus too much over to the So what kind of lens is required to help this person focus? A diverging lens. Too much focusing is happening, so we've got to spread the light out a little bit before it gets to the eye. What kind of images form always from diverging lenses? Virtual images. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> Does that mean anybody that wears glasses for any reason is living in some kind of virtual reality? You are looking, Crystal, at virtual images right now. How do I know you're looking at virtual images? Because you have glasses on. Those of you that hide it with your contact lens. Virtual images. Why? Okay. This is where this is where we get. Why does it look the same? So if you've got LASIK. Ah! Well, then I'm perfect. <laughs> no. LASIK, right, corrects the cornea. It basically puts permanent glasses on your cornea. They cut portions with a laser. They cut portions of the cornea away to shift the vision, okay, so that you don't need glasses in contact. Actually, I now need reading glasses. I don't normally use them, uh, but I probably should start wearing my reading glasses. My, it's a little bit of a contest between me and my eye doctor. 
um, we're about the same age. He's, he's just a couple years younger than I am. And um, he's needed reading classes ever since he was like 41. And I'm now 48. What year is it? 2023? Yes. I'm 49. Um, <laughs> and, uh, well, actually, I'm still 48. I'll be 49 sometime. Um, and I, and every time I come in, every year for my eye exam, first question I was done, you wearing your reading glasses yet? No. Because <laughs> he told me when he did the LASIK for me, okay, he said, oh yeah, two or three years you're going to be wearing reading glasses. I was like, yeah, betcha. <laughs> Why do these virtual images seem so real? Remember, a virtual image is created from real life. Real photons are striking your eye. It's just that your brain is interpreting where those photons came from to be in a different place than they actually came from because there's a bend, there's a refraction that's taking place. So don't think you're being cheated out of reality or anything like that. It's very real what you're experiencing. What's important about how we perceive images is the context in which we're seeing them. You still have depth perception with virtual images because far things will appear smaller, closer things will appear bigger, right? And you can judge the distance between things. That's how our brains function in determining where things are. So just because you're looking at a virtual image doesn't mean it's not real, right? It's very real. In fact, it's more real than if you had your glasses off. Because with your glasses off, you can't see anything. So let's calculate, right, what kind of correction. Now, remember, the rule for correcting a person's vision is this. And I'm, I, I said it three times already, and I keep saying it. You have to form the image at the place where they can see it. Glasses don't change the eye. Glasses help the eye. So you're putting images at the locations where these people can see them. And where can this person see an image? At 45 centimeters. Everything past 45 centimeters is blurry for them. But what they can see are things 45 centimeters and closer. So what will the image distance be for this person? Scott said infinity, and he's exactly wrong. We know we want to put the image at their far point. <laughs> That's where they can see things. But Scott, where are the objects that they are looking at? Anything. They're infinitely far away. Because for this person, anything beyond 45 is infinity. <laughs> they can't see past this point. And so the object distance is infinity. For all nearsighted people, the object distance is infinity. For nearsighted people, what's the object distance? 25. We want them to be at the normal near point. But for a nearsighted person, we want objects that are infinitely far away to be in focus. So 25 centimeters, unless you're told otherwise, 25 centimeters for farsighted people. Infinity for nearsighted people. That feels a little bit backwards, but it's the truth. Again, optical system. Eyeball over here, lens in front. I drew a converging lens. I don't know why I drew a converging. It's supposed to be a diverging lens. Doesn't matter. It's a lens. If we put the objects infinitely far away, what sign do we put on the image distance? What side of the lens? is the virtual image that's being created by this diverging lens happening, front or back? Where does the image form? Where do we want to put the image so they can see it? At the front side at 45 centimeters. Remember, 
We need to put the image where they can see it. That's the golden rule of correcting a person's vision. Put something, an image, where they can focus on it. This person can focus at 45 centimeters, and so therefore, by golly, that's where we're going to put the image. And since the image and the object are on the same side as the lens, and the front side of the lens is always the side that the object is on, what sign are you going to put on that image distance? A negative sign. How easy is this to screw up? Mathematically, it's pretty darned easy, though. Because 1 over infinity is what? And 1 over negative 45 inverted is what? Negative 45. Okay. And then the power would be 1 over 0.45, with the negative sign on it. And the power turns out to be negative 2.2 diopters. Okay. So a negative focal length lens. What does the sign convention tell you about negative focal lengths for lenses? Diverging lens, isn't it? This is what it should be. We knew that from the physics of the situation. So what have you learned today? You've learned that anybody that wears glasses sees a virtual set of images floating around in front of their face. That does not make them not qualified to drive or play video games or do anything else. They do that perfectly fine. I know because I do both. Um, I did do both a long time while wearing glasses. You learn that correcting vision is not as easy as it appears because far-sighted and near-sighted always seem backwards and so you got to be careful, right? But the key takeaways is that when you're correcting vision, objects and images are on the same side of the lens. So what does that tell you about your image distance? It's going to be negative, right? Be careful about far points and near points. Remember that you want to form images at the places where the people can see, and you'll be all right. I'll see you, see you, <laughs> on Monday.